Fanon. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night. Action. Hello, everyone. There is a fictional restaurant that is never actually seen. It is heard, it is talked about, you know of it, and it is pretty much the entire movie of said movie. You see post-newsies, but pre-Batman. Christian Bale starred in a movie called American Psycho. And there in this movie, his character, Patrick Bateman, his whole modus operandi, which drives him literally insane on a murderous rampage is all because of a fictional restaurant a 1980s greed is good fictional restaurant and that is called dorcia now there is no one better to talk about dorcia than the film's director and that is mary heron she is on restaurant fiction if you haven't already assumed restaurant fiction talks about the fictional restaurants bars and clubs in tv and film my name is Monis Rose. We are talking to Mary, all things American Psycho, all things Dorcia. We are going to start hmm, awkward silence, awkward silence, sibilance, sibilance, one, two, check, check. Now go. All right. So um, women, men, children, aliens out there. Uh, let me tell you something about the restaurant business. The restaurant business is all about supply and demand. You see, when there is a restaurant that uh, there's only one of its kind and everyone wants to go, especially, especially in the greed is good uh, 1980s, like in, um, in Manhattan, well, every single person wants to go there. It doesn't matter if the restaurant is all, all hype, and all all vibe with very very little substance or even people don't even know what the restaurant is people just want to go i'm talking about the restaurant called dorcia yes dorcia what is it who is in it who can even get in who is on the phone who is the maitre d no one even knows and yet every single person wants to go there now what let me give you a little bit of uh a background here. History in Manhattan. History in very grandiose, uh, hard to get in, private elite uh, restaurants. That's not nothing new. You know, there was the Four Seasons, but at least that has substance. You see, the Four Seasons made uh, put seasonal menus on everything. Now, now across America, we have seasonal menus. Um, there was the French snooty uh, French restaurant. Le, um, uh, Le Pavillon. Le Pavillon was, um, it made the maitre d' somebody, you know, uh, I mean, the maitre d' was a powerhouse. There was even the the quilted giraffe, the quilted giraffe. And uh, guess what? Even if all the A-listers got to eat there, at least they did have, and it's closed now, but at least they did have a, uh, a signature dish, which was called the uh, beggar's purse. Anyway, what is Dorcia? Does Dorcia is any... Is Dorsey any of those? Not really, because it has no substance. It's just a here and now type of thing. And that could actually be a good thing because, you know, people in terms of uh, if you practice meditation, all that, you know, don't be in the past, don't be in the future, be in the now. And that's kind of what Dorsey is. But if you want um, a place to really, really remember, personally for us, Restaurant fiction, we just go up to Sylvia's in Harlem because at least that place has a whole lot of substance and a lot of roots. But anyway, <laughs> that is uh, a little quick review of the mythological, the imaginative, the very fictional restaurant Dorcia from the film American Psycho. We are talking to the film's director, uh, Mary. Uh, Mary, and I'm going to, if you don't mind, we've already, um, um, Heron? Yeah. Yeah, Heron, okay. Well, anyway. Mary, uh, give us your interpretation of Dorcia. You know, even when you got the script, uh, when you were reading and you put your own spin on things, uh, what did we get right? What did we get wrong? What would you like to add? 
I first read the book before I, you know, several years before I got involved with making a movie about it. And Dorsey is obviously a, a big thing running all the way through it. And you never, you know, Patrick Bateman, the uh, sort of anti-hero, the sort of psychopathic uh, central character, is always trying to get to Dorsey and never does. And he's always, he, he has a date with his secretary and she asks if she can go to Dorsey. And you're always, you're afraid that he's going to murder her because he can't get a reservation. You never see it. So it's really just in your imagination. There's no description. All that is described is how incredibly difficult it is to get a table. And at one point when he's got this date with Jean, his secretary, and he rings up Dorcia, the voice on the other end just laughs at him when he asks for, for a table, if he can get a reservation. In the book itself, he actually horribly murders an ex-girlfriend because she said that she's seeing somebody who's a chef at Dorsey. It's a great device of, of the author, Brett Easton Ellis. It evokes all the status anxiety and the competitiveness, you know, the need to be seen at the most exclusive place. But then here we go. So raise a question. And when you're, when you're reading it and you're putting your own, you know, your own take on it, why a restaurant? Why not, say, a private country club? Why not a bar? Why, say, this restaurant with food and drink and all of that? Well, because I think there's a lot about food in the book and it's satirizing all the kind of nouvelle cuisine, very expensive new food and, and restaurants based around that food that was happening in, in New York in the 80s. So there you know, these restaurants with tiny portions and the credit sequence is about the prep. You think it's about murder because it's knives and red dripping things, but it turns out to be sauce and somebody's cutting up duck breast. It's about this minimalist food, this extremely expensive, you know, where it's all about presentation. There's um, hilarious parodies of the menus throughout American Psycho about, you know, somebody's talking about Dorsey and they say, you know, great sea urchin ceviche, or, you know, and somebody else is talking, you know, and they're also talking, one of the things about 80s, expensive 80s restaurant food. They did a kind of Americana thing, but using odd ingredients. So they'd be like, oh, I'll have the swordfish meatloaf, that kind of thing. At the same time, everybody's trying to be very thin and Bateman's terrified of gaining weight. These guys spend their whole time in restaurants. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's, that is amazing. And for, for our listeners out there, uh, sea urchin ceviche, I'm not going to lie, it's the easiest thing in the world. Just get a sea urchin. I'm just saying, I mean, you open it up. You sprinkle some lime and some salt and some red onion and boom, you got yourself a ceviche there. <laughs> so moving on, I mean, in your opinion, how does though um, Dorcia enhance, enhance the movie as a whole? It's a sort of motivation. It's a desire. And, and, you know, and it provides a couple of plot points. I think Patrick Bateman decides to kill his rival, Paul Allen, well, one of the reasons why he decides to kill him is that Paul Allen comes into a, you know, a work meeting, work conference and says how he just had great reservations or great meal at Dorcia. And Patrick Bateman's just overcome with humiliation. So I think and, you know, and then later, you know, again, as I said, with Gene, there's the, the idea that he can't get the reservation and you're worried that he's going to murder her, but they end up not going. And then there's another scene where his, uh, he's having an affair with a woman called Courtney, played by Samantha Mathis, who's a, a drug addict, basically. And he he takes her to a restaurant. He tells her it's Dorcia. And they're sitting there and, and she's looking around a little. It's a, you know, we, we found a kind of generic expensive restaurant. And she's looking around and she's kind of collapsing and she keeps like falling off her chair because she's had so many, you know, so much Valium or whatever. And she's saying, you're looking around confused and saying, is this Dorcia? And he says, yes. And I said, and, and we should have, I think we should have, and he starts re telling her off the menu what she should eat. And she, she pulls up the menu and it says in big letters, Barcadia. So you know that you're not in Dorcia. You're in a completely other restaurant, but she's so drugged out that she doesn't realize she's not in Dorcia. So, you know, it, it, it was a very useful sort of, you know, plot device throughout. First of all, been a storyteller and a filmmaker for some time now. You have a varied, awesome career. Let's talk about voice. How did you, Mary, how did you find your voice and how would you describe it? You know, you just have to learn to trust your instincts and keep listening to them and not uh, let other people's opinions 
it's, it's important to hear other people's opinions, but don't let those drown out your own instincts. You know, Mary, how do you stay consistently creative and not plateau? Oh, I think everybody plateaus. I think you just find, you know, um, I think it's, but, you know, if you're writing a script or you're developing a project, then, you know, you, you have a new subject. So the subject is what's going to keep you, you know, excited. What is an unusual habit or an absurd thing that you love? My husband and daughter say that I talk to myself, like when I'm in the kitchen or whatever, I'm just talking to myself and having conversations in my head with people or arguments with people, saying things that I, I wish I had said. So I tend to talk to myself. I, I've always done that ever since I was a kid. I'm not even aware that I'm talking I'm because I'm thinking about something in my head and then it turns out that I'm actually talking. Hey, so what about, all right, hypothetical here. Um, your home is on fire, but your, your, your family, your friends, your pets, they're all safe, out of danger. Mm-hmm. You, though, can only take five things with you. It doesn't matter the size or the weight. What are those five things? Hmm. I think letters. A good coat. <laughs> I want a coat. Maybe a pic- some pictures, photographs off the walls, family stuff. Maybe boots, um, my favorite boots. But I, I, I feel like I should bring something of my, something of, of the past, you know, maybe drawings, frame drawings off the walls. I have a lot of artwork on the walls, stuff like that. What is your restaurant tour? If uh, restaurant fiction was like, hey, Mary, um, in any decade, it could be the 80s, you know, green is good 80s, it could be like the 90s, even now. What is, yeah. where are you taking restaurant fiction? I'm going to our favorite restaurant, which is in Brooklyn, in, uh, in sort of Park Slope, there's Aldi La, Italian restaurant, Aldi La, an old favorite, it's been around for 30, 40 years, I think. And it's a wonder, wonderful Italian restaurant. It used to have just open tables and they used to not take reservations. And it's kind of, Tuscan food. It's nice, but it's not insanely expensive. And now they do take reservations. It's just, it's just, and it's kind of warm and golden and like being in a restaurant in Florence. That's really lovely. So we go there. That's like if we're having a birthday or something. We love a play, another Italian restaurant, Il Buco and Il Buco Elementari. Last time we had to celebrate something, we went to Il Buco Elementari for lunch. And that again, that's Italian. And that's beautiful. Actually, I once went all the way from where I live, way uptown, Washington Heights, to have one of their, what they call bomba, the, these round donuts. Mm-hmm. I had a great desire to have one. And I just went all the way down, like 160 blocks to, to get one of those. I would have it with espresso. I love Il Buco and Il Buco Elementari, which is more like their cafe. And then I love Vaselka. Ukrainian restaurant in the East Village. I used to live around the corner when I was young. I lived in St. Mark's Place in the villa in the East Village. Actually, we used to go to a place, the Kiev, which was open all night. So after going to a nightclub, you know, a club, you'd always end up at the Kiev at like two, three in the morning, and there'd be lots of people there that you knew. And I would just have, you know, cabbage soups. That I didn't, I remember when I was young, I would past restaurants and think, oh God, it must be amazing to go to a restaurant, you know, because in those days you would just maybe eat at a diner, but you couldn't afford to go to a restaurant. But there were all the great Ukrainian ones. And there was also in those days, like the Second Avenue Deli and stuff, and Ratner's and all these places that are, are gone, a lot of them are gone. But the Vaselka is the one that's left that I guess maybe it's still all night. I guess it is. Again, classic Ukrainian. When um, we lived in the East Village when my first our first child was born. And I remember taking baby Ruby was only like three weeks old to, out to a restaurant. And the waitress was like, are you sure you should take that baby out? It was like, yes, we have to have borscht. So I, you know, I love, love, um, love Asoka. And then I like going to um, like Jet Queens, Jackson Heights for Indian food. And in some ways I'd like, you know, there's a great Oaxacan restaurant in the Bronx that does nothing but mole, you know, Beautiful. I can't remember the name. It's so nice. It's run by a family. But you can just look up Oaxacan Restaurant Mole, the Bronx. I'm kind of more into that kind of thing, a little traveling. Ethiopian. I love a good Ethiopian restaurant. Stuff like that. That's really what I... But I, I'm very into food, but I'm not as into the very fancy. Mary, thank you. That was awesome. You are awesome. You are welcome back anytime. 
after you know after uh, your new Salvador Dali film, which will be coming out. So we will stay tuned for that. Come on by if there is food, which I'm sure there is because Salvador Dali was heavily, heavily into food uh, amongst wine, amongst a lot of other Epicurean delights. Come on by the Restaurant Fiction Podcast. It was awesome having you. Those who want to watch all of Mary's work, well, guess what? Google her. Go on her IMDb. It is all there. Her plethora of awesome, awesome art. As for us with Restaurant Fiction, well, guess what? You're listening to us, so you found us on one platform. If you don't like iTunes, you can always switch over to Audible or Spotify or iHeartRadio, yada, yada, yada. We are there. And please help us out if you will. Just recommend one episode if it's this one, if it's the next one, if it's the one before this, to a friend, to a colleague, to a peer, to an acquaintance, to a Facebook friend, or maybe someone even deeper, maybe even a pet, like a goldfish. Anyway, we just want you to share the love. My name is Monas Rose, and as always, keep it real, keep it fresh, and keep it on the flip side. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant.